joining us i'm carlo with the unexpected journal and we are on our was this number four our fourth se segment in our live stream launch party for an unexpected journal the dragons issue and i am here with donald catchings and christine norville and they are going to um share a little bit about the pieces that they wrote and we're going to start by letting them introduce themselves and just tell us a brief summary about their piece so Christine, would you like to start? Sure, I'm Christine Norville. I am a recent Arkansas transplant, having moved here for a new position at a classical school in Salem Springs, Arkansas, and having lived three decades <laughs> in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But I worked in classical education world for quite a while and um, love to write articles for various places. and. I have a lot of reading and teaching interest of all kinds. So the piece that um, I submitted that I was most interested in was how Walter Wenger and Jr. relies upon one of the ancient meanings of the dragon or the devil that he pulled from the Aberdeen bestiary and calls him simply worm instead of Draco or uh, dragon. And this great phenomenal evil is the strongest presence in a group of three novels that he wrote over a period of 20 years um, that feature its own menagerie or bestiary, if you will, all based on the nun priest tale with Chanticleer the rooster and all the animals um, being um, anthropomorphized. So it's fascinating because he's he will tell you in his own writings and in his later editions that celebrated uh, his National Book Award for the first book, The Book of the Dun Cow, Wangerin writes that he's like, this is not a fable. <laughs> it might be an allegory, but really you should call it an extended beast fable. <laughs> so I like how most authors uh, hesitate, if not flat out refuse to identify the type of work or genre, they're they're hesitant to paste a label on it. But Wangren at least gave us that much to work from um, as you meet his animal characters and the evil that they face. Awesome. And I thought it was really interesting. It was, it was interesting because you pulled so much out of the story in the book, but it's a children's book, right? Isn't it? No. <laughs> or is it not? It looks like it is. The book of the dead. You know, it does. It looks, it does. For the cover, it looks like it is. Yeah, I I would consider the evil uh, strong and graphic. I probably wouldn't hand it to a kid under 10 or 12. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. So how would you classify that? Because literally looking at the cover, it looks like it's young adult. I know. Maybe. I know. I think, yeah. I, I mean, the animal cast is more representative of the medieval time in which he sets everything, almost pre-medieval, um, because this is a time without humans, although that's never explained. Mm -hmm. So um, I realized from the publishing, publishing houses, their standpoint, they're like, well, it's all about animals. <laughs> if you put animals on the cover, okay. children will assume it's for them, right? Um, it's really yeah. spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, uh, it, it's deeper and quite intense for um, upper readers. So teens, adults, we okay. all learn from it. Okay. Good to know. Okay, Donald, how about you? Well, I guess I'll try to just be as simple as possible. Uh, my name's Donald Ketchings. I write for an unexpected journal. I, I, Pretty much every episode, or I mean, every uh, every volume for the last I don't know three or four years. I can't even remember anymore. It's been so long. Uh, but I, I love writing with the journal, and of course, I write outside of the journal. I'm an author. I write 
anything from sci-fi novels to poetry compilations and collections. Uh, you know, kind of always writing something new. Uh, right now, I'm actually working on a couple of different projects. One of them being the uh, the short story, kind of an excerpt from uh, a, a novella I'm working on called Violence of Fire. That was also in uh, in the journal. It was published in the journal this time around. And I've got a couple of other dragon works. Actually, I'm working with this year, which are which are fun. It just okay. kind of all happens to be. Uh, it all kind of happened to fall in the same year, writing a dragon poem, writing a dragon short story, writing a dragon novel that I'm hoping to be kind of like a uh, kind of actually something for about to the ages 10 to 12, actually, is what I'm what I'm looking at, uh, kind of the age range. So uh, just always kind of working on something new. And and uh, anyway, so what I wrote in the journal this time was two had two editions, one being Violence of Fire is the excerpt from the full work. Violence of Fire, which I've been working on, and uh, in, in there, you, what you find is the uh, a young up-and-coming hero and his friend are basically selling into the darkness of night, into a place where they know there is a dragon, but they know they have to sail past the dragon, they have to sail through the dragon to get to an even greater mm -hmm. enemy that waits in a land far beyond that. And the other was a poem called Desolation, where I discuss... Uh, basically, something I've seen as an educator is, is the idea that we, in in our modern world, do not prize education. And I think one of the reasons why are at least three reasons, three dragons of sorts that have destroyed modern education would be uh, naivety, ennui, and apathy. The idea that the native language of young people today is to remain naive, and they are so encumbered with digital distractions that they're bored with everything on we and they and then the idea of apathy I've, I've met so many young people who just don't care there's they know nothing for certain they can't know anything for certain and so they've given up and anyway so i wrote both of these pieces one very different in mind but still both having that same theme of a dragon that must be overcome and uh, anyway, so that's that's kind of been the theme of my year is dragons to overcome. Oh, even in my personal life. But I won't get into that here. But it's all been dragons to overcome over the last year. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's the story of humanity. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And you're um, as you're talking, your Judas poem, uh, that kind of seems sort of dragony, too. But that's not in this piece. But the first uh, the first section that we're going to cover today is we're going to be talking about dragons and destiny. And so both of you highlight an individual's purpose in facing their dragons. So Christine, you talk about the way Chancellor Claire exhibits virtue in weakness. And Donald, in Violence of Fire, your story illustrates that we have to face the most difficult things to have true victory. And so can you share your thoughts on the way dragon, uh, what dragons symbolize in how their actions are often what makes a hero. So, Donald, do you want to start? Sure, sure. I'll just uh, make a quick point. Uh, what I think is the way dragons lead us to be heroes or lead the hero to be even greater is that the dragon is the ultimate foe. It's the symbol of ultimate darkness. It's an undefeatable foe, really. In the end, the only way we can defeat the dragon is through perseverance, through faith, and through trust that something greater is actually going to help us. Uh, and, and so I've even, actually, the, the book I've written, a book I've written called Strength and Weakness, which is actually the first book in the series which Violence of Fire follows up, you have this idea that the the true hero it can only be the true hero when they learn to have strength and weakness you find the same thing in the samson story that's really where i got the idea from the true hero finds strength and weakness and so i think when we're facing our dragons we have to recognize that the chances of winning by strength are zero and i think that might be mm -hmm. what develops the, the facing the dragon develops the hero into the greater hero. They have to recognize that they won't have to rely on one greater than themselves or on something greater than themselves to be the true hero, the, to have their true strength. That's, that's my thoughts on it. 
Awesome. I want to read this um, quote from, uh, I think this is, let me see, it's from Violence of Fire. The greatest glory is to fight courageously without the praise of men. And every age has, and this is from uh, Desolation, every age has dragons to slay fiery serpents who will not relent. Oh, wait. So I think that is, uh, this is one of the things that I've, um, it's really stood out to me just going through these pieces is that we get so, it's like we want to fix, like we want the 90 minute movie, you know, where you have the resolution and that's not like, you know, it's, it's ongoing. That's the struggle, you know, the, the battle against chaos and against evil. And that's the fight that we're in. But um, Christine, do you want to talk a little bit about your thoughts about uh, how uh, it's often dragons that make the hero? Your, your piece really highlights this really strongly. Sure. I, I mean, it, it begins very slowly in the Book of the Dawn Cow, the first book, because Wangerin describes the earth this way. He says, the apple has a grub in it, the earth a tapeworm. <laughs> and it's this presence of evil literally seeping into the community of the rooster and his coop and the animals that live about them in in the woods again no humans not a mention or a hint of them <laughs> although my students always ask how is there a coop built <laughs> all right oh come on it's a fable <laughs> we don't have to explain every everything that way but at the beginning of the book, it's like the rooster, Chanticleer, our hero, is completely unaware that there's an evil other than when he wakes up and has a grumpy morning. He's not aware until one or two animals die in his small kingdom. And once he realizes he needs to find out what's going on uh, very quickly, the, the evil increases. He doesn't understand what's happening quickly enough but how Wangerin uses his character there is that Chanticleer begins to show us his, his virtues, his persistence, his um, ability to save, uh, to redeem various animals, to rescue, to know the right words to say. Um, the list of strengths goes on and on, which is good to know, because once um, Worm begins to creep closer and closer underneath the earth, then the dreams and the visions and the doubts begin. And that is how Worm um, insinuates himself into this community. So Wangren uh, gives full recognition to the fact that um, he is stealing the idea from the Aberdeen bestiary for his dragon. And straight from the Aberdeen bestiary, it reads, and this is in the article, he says, the devil is like the dragon. He is the most monstrous serpent of all. He is often aroused from his cave and causes the air to shine because, emerging from the depths, he transforms himself into the angel of light and deceives the foolish with hopes of vain glory and worldly pleasure. The dragon is said to be crested as the devil wears the crown of the king of pride. The dragon's strength lies not in its teeth but its tail as the devil, deprived of his strength, deceives with lies those whom he draws to him. It fits wondrously with the, nun, the nun's priest's tale as Chaucer first wrote it because the rooster's primary vice is pride. And it's there that Worm knows to begin picking at him through thoughts and dreams and nightmares. And by that point, Chanticleer realizes he is a small protagonist indeed to fight this mighty beast of um, a worm underneath the ground. Who does eventually erupt through as uh, the final battles happen in book one. So the fact is that the evil is great and sizable, immense and massive. And it is only when Chanticleer realizes that he cannot do it on his own um, that things begin to change for him because God does send a cow, the dun cow. <laughs> who is a representation of the Holy Spirit to counsel him, to encourage him and give him strength to do what God has already gifted him to do, which is cry different crows um, that have power with them. The crows potens as Wangren uses in the book. Awesome. 
So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is um, really about recognizing dragons. And you've already touched on that a little bit, um, Christine, but you have, it's, that was a thing that kept coming up in both of your pieces that the, the dragons or the evil wolves, it's kind of the same shape, but tactics change over time. And so you focus on that in your uh, poem, Desolation. And uh, Christine, you talk about how worm strategy kind of changed, but the goal was still the same. So um, would you, each of you like to talk about that? And Christine, do you want to start? Sure. I, I mean, worms, worms uh, strategy does change out of necessity once the animals begin to fight against him but it's almost military in his strength and that he comes at the rooster and his animals through an alternate, almost the doppelganger rooster, <laughs> the evil one, Cynix, who takes over um, the hens and the coop and the reproduction and, and the birthing of the basilisk army um, that does great damage at, at the same time waging war mentally and spiritually and it's such a great it's such a great conflict where you really see no hope uh, for these weak innocent animals I mean it's interesting to me that um, at Donald's article about the naivete and the ennui and the apathy they are very much present in the various animals from the deer to the fox to the just a range of them around Chanticleer's kingdom where ignorance was bliss. What dragon? What what worm? There's no evil here. We have no enemies. Um, so it's fascinating how how that actually actually works. It's it's unique that way. So I want to hear from Donald a little bit, too, while I'm mentioning that. And it's fresh. Go. Why well, you know? I, I've never read. Uh, I've never read the, the. I read through your article, but I've never read the work you were discussing. Uh, but that's quite interesting. I I guess I hadn't really thought about the idea of naivety and ennui and apathy being something a little more perpetual. I was thinking, uh, just being the experience as a modern educator, I was mm -hmm. thinking more of it being a modern problem or a contemporary problem, I guess I should say. And uh, but. But truthfully, maybe it is a little more uh, it's a little more perpetual than I imagined. But still, even if that is the evil that we tend towards, the ignorance is bliss. I, I think I think Carla is bringing a valid point in to say that the way in which that ignorance is brought about is different. It changes how the ignorance gets there. Um, What's well, that that quote from Isaiah? Uh, the idea that uh, it's ignorance that destroys God's people every day. Uh, of course, I'm I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact quote, uh, but that's something that I think I've seen. Hosea. Oh, is that in Hosea? <laughs> okay, I was thinking it was yeah. Isaiah. So okay, so there's my ignorance. Uh, but but uh, you know, there's there's this idea that I I grew up in church and did not really have a very good biblical or theological philosophical education. I just did not I was very ignorant of many things. And it wasn't until I read the case for Christ and was overwhelmed with the information, the knowledge, the, the reality of the truth and the facts behind Christianity that I began to really truly take my faith seriously. And then it wasn't even until my late twenties that I took my educational journey, got my undergrad and went on to get my master's, become a teacher, uh, I was a poor student growing up, and, and now I'm a pretty good student. And, and it, was, it was not knowledge, I wouldn't say not in any Gnostic form, it's not knowledge that saved me, but it was the, the ability to not be so bored, to not be so apathetic, and just kind of accept things as they are, to remain naive, and to remain in that ignorance, is what led me to want to be better, to want to do better, to kind of like the idea of education leading to virtue, education is meant to make better people, that kind of idea. So I guess the goal maybe of the dragon seems to remain the same in human history, though its means may be different. It is still a dragon and it still wants us to remain ignorant or blind or remain in the darkness or some kind of metaphor of that sort. 
And uh, I mean, that's what I have in my poem, Desolation. And I, and I oh, so I guess that also ec echoes uh, in, in the work that you discussed in your article, which I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, the one in, well, there's actually several verses that kind of reference that. One is in Hosea, I think it's 4, 6, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Uh, sometimes people, that's like revelation, but it's really um, what, what God is talking about. People have a knowledge of him, and so they perish because we're not connected to the one that we image, right? So um, the other one is... Um, Without, with the lack of vision, uh, people perish. I actually uh, did a Bible study on that, most misunderstood vision. But it's like we have to be directed by the Holy Spirit to really have that true direction and vision. But um, one of the things you, you guys have both kind of talked about, like um, younger generations, I think, personally, I think what is the big challenge is that um, Ted talked about this in the last episode, that it's like we're ambivalent about whether or not there's truth. And so if you don't think that there is a truth and an absolute to go to, then that, then that really kind of undercuts a sense of purpose, right? So you, how can you, if, if there is no truth, if there is no absolute, if there is no goal, no end, um, if we don't recognize that we are in this war, right? It's the spiritual battle and that the struggle is ongoing that um, you, you can't really have direction there. But um, as you were talking about the things that came to my mind um, and connected with some um, a church in Pakistan, and uh, they're having some Bible studies, and the pastor there is that they're basically caring for Afghan refugees. And so one of the Bible studies, there was a, a group of them that were there and there were these young kids there, like, I mean, you know, 18, 20, you know, and so they just, they came from Afghanistan. They were not Christians when they left, but they became Christians after they came to Pakistan. And it was because of the interaction with the Christians who were caring for them. Mm -hmm. And so the person who was teaching, uh, my friend, Mark Ritchie, I've done interviews with him before. Um, he asked them, you know, what was it that made you decide to become a Christian because Pakistan is not technically legal, but it's one of the most hospitable places to Christians. Um, they're at a severe disadvantage. So why would you, why would you throw your lot in with this, something that's going to put you at a disadvantage? And they said, because it was real that they thought that Jesus was real and that having Jesus as savior, it made a real change in their life. And as they were explaining it, they just had this openness you know, and, um, the thing that this, that's always struck me about that is that they were, I don't say this to anybody who's listening that may have been in the military and been overseas in Afghanistan. And I know that things that have happened today may be thinking it's, it wasn't worth it, but seeing those kids, I can tell you young adults, they're young adults, um, that I think it was worth it because, when America went in, that was basically about the time they were born, especially for the, the young woman that, that was talking. She wouldn't have had an opportunity to read or to be educated. If America hadn't been there and was kind of holding the line to give them space to be able to learn because the Taliban was coming in and was shutting all that down. So I can tell you, I've, I've seen the evidence that it was worth it. And so we all... Um, we all serve the kingdom in different ways. And so anybody that was there that was protecting that space at that time, you were a part of her coming to a place where she could know Jesus. But anyway, do you guys want to share um, some final thoughts on uh, the fight against evil and dragons? Donald, do you want to start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I'll say it like this. Um, and it'll connect with what you were saying with those young, young adults and students in Pakistan. That search for truth. That is what we are doing. When we are fighting dragons, we are searching for truth. Whether it be from my poem, Desolation, uh, or it be Violence of Fire with Kutakal and his friend Ilantatu. They are facing dragons. There is a truth. They have to go through the dragon. Whether it be that we have to go through the dragon of our ignorance 
or whether we have to go through the dragon that stands between us and our greater enemy that will prepare us for uh, facing the dragon who is the master of all dragons, the devil himself. It doesn't matter. We have to go through that dragon. And there's to, to find the truth, to find the truth of who we are, self-discovery, to find the truth about God, and his power and his uh, salvation. And this is where I'll, I'll pull it back to those young adults in Pakistan. I had a student two years ago who was, uh, he graduated two years ago. We remain in contact. Good kid and very smart. And uh, just to kind of not get too in detail, I'll say this, that I, I was able to impact him with certain things that we were able to discuss in class. And there was one thing he said to me uh, that has really stuck with me and I think echoes with these, these young people in Pakistan is that he realized that God was real and that was both the most terrifying thing that he could imagine and yet also the greatest thing that could be true. So it is the most terrifying truth to recognize that God is real, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that there is a triune God and that he is, he is real, he is true, he is good. That is terrifying. It's a terrifying reality because it means we're accountable. It means we matter. It means there is truth. It means we are responsible and so on and so forth. Uh, but it also, in that terribleness, in that fearfulness of that fact, it's also liberating because we have a reason to fight. And that's what I'll say. Awesome. And Christine, how about you? Yeah, I, I find this um, a beautiful parallel to what you just shared, Carla, because it shows the power of community. Um, in these novels that I wrote about, it's when Chanticleer is isolated and alone, especially at night, that he is most um, most tempted to give in or even to kill himself. But it's when he finds comfort in others and realizes that God has provided um, allies with him among the animals and their giftings, it's when they work together that it actually becomes a community that's able to overcome the evil, even when each of them realizes they must sacrifice something of themselves or sacrifice themselves entirely. So it's, it's that idea you can't go it alone, um, that you have to be part of uh, very much, even from the bestiary, you must be part of the universal church. You must be in that community to strengthen each other spiritually. Awesome. We are almost at the end of our time. So um, can you just, just, if anybody wants to follow your work, can you share where they can find you? Christine, do you want to start? Sure. I'm at christinenorville.com. I have a teaching blog I mostly keep up with. <laughs> it depends on when you move states and things. I may not have written a lot in the last month or two, but um, I, I enjoy participating on Twitter quite a lot. And um, I have a Facebook page, Facebook author page, a study guide for C.S. Lewis's novel, Till We Have Faces, um, some extra awesome. writing like that. So, Awesome. Okay, Donald, how about you? Uh, well, I'd say the best way to find me, I have uh, my own website would be donaldwketchings.com. Uh, I need to be more up to date on that. Uh, other than that, you can find me on Amazon, Donald W. Ketchings Jr. You can search me and you'll see I've got plenty of work out there. Uh, science fiction novels, some shorter works, some poetry compilations. Uh, but honestly, if you go to inkwellandpenllc.com, that's where you'll find more works. Uh, some stuff I do under a uh, well, work I do with my family under a pen name, H.A. Harper. We work together and create poet, poetry compilations and uh, kids' stories, things like that. Uh, and uh, anyway, so whether you go to my website or Inkwell and Pen's website, of course, we have Facebooks and the works, you know, Instagram and all that stuff. Got to have all the social media. Uh, but, you know, just go check it out. And if any of it interests you, Give me, give, you know, shoot me a, a message and, uh, and I'd love to discuss anything, dragons or the works, anything. Awesome. And if you're in the Houston area, Don, you might see Donald at a local festival because he's out and about all the time. And uh, I keep meaning to like keep looking where you're going to be so I can stop by and see you and your family. <laughs> Super cute. You can follow his uh, Instagram at Inkwell and Pen is it LLC. 
Yes, anyway, ma'am. so you see ki- ki- pictures of his kids a lot. Super cute. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And we are going to um, go into our intermission now where we are going to have another giveaway. But thank you so much for your contributions and for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We'll see you next time.